Hello everyone. Today we'll be talking about how to manage your patient with SAADH. Please watch my other videos on hyponatremia to understand the underlying pathophysiology. The links are in description below. So let's get started. So first thing you have to understand in SAADH is water and solute intake. We'll take an example of a normal person who is eating a 800 milli osmol diet and he is drinking 2 liter of water. Since I's and O's will be matched, he will make 2 liters of urine and his body will make a urine osmolality of 400 and his sodium will be maintained. If he drinks 4 liters of water, well, his urine volume will be 4 liters and his urine osmolality will drop to 200 and his sodium will be maintained. And this person can go on and drink up to 10 liter of water and his urine osmolality can drop to 80 and he should still be able to maintain his sodium. However, the lowest urine osmolality he can reach is 50. So for example, if he drinks 20 liters of water, he can pee a max of 16 liter. So his water balance will be positive 4 and that would make his sodium drop down. This is what happens in psychogenic polydipsia. His maximum urine osmolality is around 1200. So if he drinks 0.4 liters of water a day, his urine volume will be 0.6. So he is in a negative water balance and his sodium will start rising. This will lead to hypernatremia. So let's see what happens when an SAADH patient. SAADH patient, their urine osmolality is high. Let's say example 600. And he is going to make 1.3 liters urine because he ate 800 and his urine osmolality is 600. So 2 minus 1.3, that is plus 0.7. So he still is in a positive fluid balance if he drinks 2 liters of water. So his sodium will start getting worse. So I'm going to put him on 1 liter fluid restriction and he still makes 1.3 liters of urine. But now he is in a negative water balance and his sodium will start rising. If you want the sodium to rise faster, you can put him on stricter water restriction, say 0.5. And his daily water balance will be around negative 0.8. So the most important thing in the SIDH is free water restriction. To figure out how much you need free water restriction, you figure out how much patient is eating and divided it by urine osmolality. A normal daily diet has around 1000 milliosmol. For example, if the patient is eating only 50% of his meals, that means he's eating around 500 milliosmoles a day. If his urine osmolality is 400, the amount of fluid restriction that you would put him on would be 500 by 400 and you can add incipient losses of 0.3 so 1.5 liters now understand that this is the maximum amount of water that he can drink without worsening hyponatremia so to make your sodium rise you have to choose a number which is lower than 1.5 in this case if you want to know more details please watch how much fluid restriction my patient needs where i have explained this in more details our SIDH patient was on taking 2 liters and now you put him on 1.5 fluid restriction. Now he's still making 1.3 liter of urine because he's eating 800 and his urine osmolality is 600. So he's still a positive fluid balance and his sodium will continue to drop. But if you put him on 1.3 and you match it with his urine output, his sodium will be maintained. But to increase the sodium, you have to go lower than 1.3. And you can see that if you put him on 1 liter, he'll be in, in negative 0.3 liters per day water balance. Approximately, if you have negative one liter of free water balance a daily, you will see your sodium rise by three to four points. How do you know your free water restriction is working? Well, your sodium will slowly rise. And if you want to send a urine sodium and urine potassium, and if they are more than serum sodium, most likely your water restriction is not working and your sodium will most likely go down. You did a good job. Patient was eating 800. He was on one liter water restriction and he is in a negative water balance and his sodium is slowly rising. However, he starts eating lesser amount of food, say 400 milliosmol a day. With the same amount of fluid restriction, you see that now he is in a positive water balance. Because 400 divided by 600, he can make only 0.6 liters of urine and his sodium will start decreasing again. So you need to add solute to these patients. And you can use it in form of salt tablets, 3% saline or urea. Let's see how 3% saline helps in SIADH. 
So this patient is getting 500 cc of 3% saline, which will give him 500 milliosmoles of solute and 500 cc of water. So his total solute intake is 1300. Since his urine osmolality is 600, he is going to make 1300 by 600, that is 2.2 liters of urine. Total amount of intake is 1 liter from oral and 0.5 liters from the 3%. And if you subtract 2.2, you get negative 0.7 so his sodium will slowly start increasing if you did not watch his fluid restriction say you kept him on two liters of water restriction doing these calculations again you see that he is now in positive water balance and his sodium will continue to drop despite three percent and similarly if you put a more restricted water intake your sodium will rise faster important thing is whenever you put somebody on three percent make sure your fluid restriction is very strict. The second method to increase the sodium is using salt tablets. 12 gram salt has around 400 milliosmoles in it. So now his total solute intake, you increase to 1200. He, since his urine osmolality is 600, he is going to make two liters of urine. And now his eyes and oats seems to be well balanced if he drinks two liters and his sodium will maintain. If you decrease the salt tablet dose, he will get into more positive fluid balance. And if you increase the salt load, you will get into negative water balance. So that's how you figure out how much salt tablet your patient needs by looking at your urine osmolality and free water intake. Use of salt is very useful in chronic hyponatremia as an outpatient. However, you can use it in your inpatient population as well. Some people use urea for the same reason. Molecular weight of urea is 60. So 60 gram of urea gives you one osmole. If you give him 30 grams of urea per day, which is equal to 500 milliosmole, he is going to make 2.2 liters of urine and he will be in negative water balance. So looking at amount of urea, amount of food that he is eating, urine osmolality and water intake, you can figure out what would be the dose of urea that is required. Urea has shown to re reduce the risk of osmotic demyelination syndrome in animal models. So this may explain why ESRD patients with hyponatremia do not develop ODS after hemodialysis, which corrects their sodium pretty rapidly. Free water loss is equal to water intake minus milliosmoles eaten divided by urine osmolality. And you know that negative one liter of free water will result in approximately three to four milliequivalent rise in sodium. And this will depend upon their total body water. There is really no role of 0.9 normal saline in SIADH. The reason for this is saline has only 300 milliosmol and in patients with SIADH, their urine osmolality is usually higher than this. So let's say 500 milliosmol per liter. So these patients, since their urine osmolality is 500, they should be able to pee out 300 milliosmol only in 616 cc of water and 384 cc will remain inside and will make the sodium lower. Always look at urine osmolality and do not give any fluids with lower osmolality than patient urine, otherwise your sodium will start falling. In SIDH, some patients will receive Lasix. In a normal person, sodium potassium 2 chloride channel pumps out sodium into the renal medulla to maintain the medullary concentration and gives an osmotic gradient so that water can be reabsorbed through echoporin channels. Lasix blocks these channels and because of diuresis and hypovolemia, your echoporin channels increase in number in the distal convoluted tubules. However, since no sodium is able to enter renal medulla, the medullary concentration drops. Therefore, the gradient for water movements decreases significantly and there is more loss of free water in the urine. Thiazides work on the sodium chloride channel in renal cortex. So if you block these channels with thiazides, you will have similar increased number of aquaporin channels in your distal convoluted tubules. However, you still have that high gradient for free water absorption Therefore, more free water is going to absorb and can result in hyponatremia.
the same patient with SIDs or 2 liter fluid restriction, his sodium was dropping because he was drinking 2 liters. However, if you give him Lasix, you will drop his urine osmolality, say to 300. Now his urine volume is 2.6 liters and now he is in net negative water balance. So his sodium will improve. Vaptans and demiclocycline, they decrease urine osmolality by antagonizing ADH receptors. We have V2 receptors in the distal convoluted tubules and the ADH will result in aquaporin channels and that will absorb free water. However, vaptans will block this receptor and your aquaporin channels will be internalized and you will be losing a lot of free water in the urine and that will help your hyponatremia. Vaptans have been shown to improve sodium and some mental scores, but there is really no improvement in other markers like mortality. And these drugs can cause a rapid rise in sodium as well. We have Tolvaptan, which is available as oral medication, but it has been shown to have few complications like progression of polycystic kidney disease and elevation of liver enzymes. For the treatment for SIADH, Treat the underlying pathology that's causing SIADH. Have your patient on free water restriction. If you want, you can check your urine sodium and potassium to figure out if fluid restriction is inadequate or not. You can go to my previous lecture and try to learn how to calculate free water restriction for any of your patients. You can add solute if needed in form of hypertonic saline, salt tablets or urea. You can add Lasix to the salt tablets for better efficacy. You can certainly use other medications like Tolvaptan, Demiclocycline. However, these are mostly used in outpatient and its use would be best left to nephrologist. Try to avoid these medications in inpatient settings. Thank you.